Welcome to the fourth Congo Global Thematic Webinar on Substantive Issues. I'm Liberato Bautista, the President of Congo. Thank you for including us in this webinar as a part of your day, wherever you are in the world, this minute and this very day. It's a blessed and good day to focus on crucial and urgent issues confronting people and the planet. Today, we focus on peace, on human security and sustainability of people and the planet. It is a special day because this webinar is brought to you by Congo and two wonderful collaborators, the World Academy of Art and Science and the Campaign on Human Security for All, which is a partnership between the United Nations Human Security Fund and the World Academy. Congo is an international NGO in general consultative status with the United Nations. We are a conferential body comprised of more than 600 NGOs variedly accredited across the United Nations system, but mainly with ECOSOC consultative status. Congo was founded in 1948, and this year we are celebrating our 75th anniversary. And this thematic webinar you are attending is one of six we are holding this year. And that's exactly what the webinars have been about. It started with the Civil Society Summit on Substantive Issues in October 2021, attended by over a thousand participants. That summit produced a synthesis report, which resulted in an action of the Congo General Assembly in December 2021 to follow up the six summit themes with six thematic webinars. Webinar one was on social justice, focusing mainly on migration justice, on racial justice, and health justice. Webinar two, dealt with the pursuit of global justice and solidarity, focusing on the achievement of Agenda 2030, on sustainable development and on humanitarian action. Last week, the third webinar focused on gender justice, on youth and intragenerational and intergenerational justice and solidarity for future generations. Between the summit and the three webinars, we have reached about 2,000 participants from civil society, UN member states, UN officials and staff from around the world. Because of our commitment to gender equality and gender justice, I'm happy to report back to you that the total of all our speakers and moderators and rapporteurs we, have, we had 63% women and 37% men of all our speakers and moderators and rapporteurs. Of these speakers, 16% were young people below 30, which is also a commitment to the youth of the present and of the future generations. We have also brought these webinars in four languages, English, Arabic, French, and Spanish also a commitment of Congo to linguistic diversity and linguistic justice. Congo's principal mandate is to ensure that NGOs accredited to the UN have all the necessary access to the premises and promises of the United Nations by leveraging our convening capacity as a conferential body Congo provides a platform for the voice and agency of civil society and NGOs to permeate those premises, physical spaces, and promises, the substantive agenda of the United Nations. By premises, I meant the physical spaces for consultations, collaboration, and cooperation, such as this webinar. By premises, I mean the substantive issues that pursue the pillars of the United Nations system, human dignity and human rights, peace and security, sustainable development and human progress, 
and harmonious relations of nations under the rule of law. Intrinsic to these pillars is the promise of the United Nations to pursue peace and human security and to promote human dignity and protect human life for the flourishing of human life and that of planetary integrity. Today's webinar is about this and more. And I am excited by the distinguished speakers uh, we are bringing to you at this webinar. As I said last week in webinar three, human security and planetary sustainability are at stake. If national and multilateral budgets are a statement of our moral bearings, we are in deep moral deficit today because we fund more war than fund more for peace. And the things that make for peace and human flourishing are lacking the necessary funds. The life-giving work needs funding by national and multilateral mechanisms and institutions. Congo's organizational mantra over the years since 2008, and it antedates the discussion of the future at the UN, has been defining the present, shaping the future, and making the change now. Therefore, we have also made that mantra the overriding theme of the six global thematic webinars. The added emphasis is to make the change now. This is what we endeavor to identify today at this webinar. We will define the present, yes. We will shape the future, we must. But more urgent and pressing are the changes we are willing to identify and are going to make. What changes are we willing to make and do so that peace, human security, and sustainability for people and the planet do not linger as empty words in national and multilateral texts, but come alive and visible in our human and social relations as much as in our planetary life and ecological systems. Today's webinar, as is the entire series of webinars, is designed to weigh in on multilateral discussions at the United Nations related to the United Nations Secretary General's Our Common Agenda, the SDG Summit, the Summit of the Future next year, the New Peace Agenda, and so much more. Excellencies, civil society colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we meet today in not so many eaves before the United Nations General Assembly convenes. Let's set a message loud and clear. Let's hear what our speakers have to say and then get your social media outlets barraged with the good messages urging, urging member states, the United Nations system with calls for peace, for human security and sustainability for people on the planet. We have the social media uh, accounts uh, on the QR code uh, that's been screened and on every slide that you will see, there will be the QR code. And so let's go on with the webinar. Please make sure that if you need interpretation, you click the button uh, which says uh, interpretation. Please be aware of the etiquette for holding a webinar. Uh, please uh, mute yourselves unless you are scheduled to speak. I'll give that uh, 30 seconds for people to read quickly. Uh, I hope that uh, all participants uh, who have questions, please post them on Q&A. None of us will be moderating the chat, but the chat except our uh, rapporteurs. Our rapporteurs are intentional listeners and they will be checking the chat for possible uh, comments uh, that will be fielded to the moderator. The moderators will have the responsibility to choose which question, if there is, to field to uh, their panelists. So 
ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to introduce to you uh, a, a remark from Gary Jacobs, the president and CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science and the executive chair of the Human Security for All campaign. I must say, Gary and the members and the fellows of the World Academy of Art and Science present here, it's been an honor a little bit over two years now to be myself a uh, WAS fellow. Gary, you have the screen. Liberato, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for inviting us to partner with Congo for this very important event. And my congratulations on this, the 75th anniversary of Congo. And the, the topics you have chosen for the six uh, webinars this year are certainly extremely relevant and, and very important to the work that, the, that we're doing and that the world needs to be doing in, at this time. And I'm particularly happy to be invited to partner with you on this webinar which covers the, the themes and the interlinkage between peace, human security, and sustainable development. Uh, WAS was founded in 1960 by eminent intellectuals and scientists uh, to concerned about the social responsibility of the field, those in the field of knowledge for how knowledge is applied in society. And we've been working for 60 years uh, now on strategies to see how that knowledge can be better used. In 2021, WAS partnered with Congo on a survey of Congo members on the subject of human security. This was done in collaboration with the United, United Nations Trust Fund on Human Security. And then later in the year, in October, I was invited as a speaker at the Congo Civil Society Summit on Substantive Issues, in which I spoke about our proposal to work with the United Nations on what we called HS4A, a campaign on human security for all. And it's these, these previous events that are the reason that I and a number of my colleagues, many of my colleagues are present here today to participate in this important event. The HS4A was launched in January of 2023 at an unlikely place at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas before an audience of about 120,000 leading business leaders and technology leaders from around the world, including the largest technology companies in the world that we all are associated with in one way or another. Over the last eight months, we've been working intensively with a wide variety of groups in the world from interfaith groups. Uh, uh, Liberato was the moder was the, get the host of, uh, of, of a very interesting event with interfaith groups from all over the world, which we partnered with on human security in January. EarthX, the very large environmental expo that takes place annually. The Sustainable Development Solutions Network, particularly the, our partners in Europe, uh, the Inter-Academy Panel of about 140 national academies, IPU, which is the Inter-Parliamentary Union of 170 plus parliaments of the world, which we're working with now, and others uh, that are coming up in Unga Week, just a couple of uh, a short time from now. And I mentioned that only to uh, give you a background that the message that we would like to share and learn and interact with you on today is a message we feel it's it's relevant and important to everybody in the world, regardless of the sector, regardless of our professions, regardless of the work we do. And that's the message of human security. And as also a member of ECOSOC, we are dedicated and committed to do what we can in partnership with Congo and other organizations like this to enhance the impact of the UN agenda for uh, Agenda 2030. And that's where human security, we feel, plays an important role. This seminar is gonna look closely at the association between peace and human security and sustainability. And I think we all agree that peace is an absolutely essential basis and condition for human security. 
But P says it's narrowly interpreted is no longer a sufficient standard for governing relations between nations. Human security is a broader concept that includes meeting all of the essential conditions for stability and a secure peace in society and for the people of the planet. Uh, the concept of human security was first introduced by the UNDP in their 1994 Human Development Report. And we're very fortunate today as one of our keynote speakers to have uh, uh, the former uh, uh, deputy administrator of uh, UNDP uh, to share with us her views on this, uh, on the development of this, this concept. My colleagues will elaborate on the detail, on the scope and content of the work that we're doing with the UN on human security, but I'd just like to mention uh, a few critical points that tie into the whole conference. One is that human security is a cross-cutting theme. It relates to all of the issues that we're addressing in, uh, in Agenda 2030, all the 17 SDGs. Uh, but it's also a common denominator. It's an intersecting point that connects all these dimensions together in their planetary environment as dimensions of life for the planet, as dimensions of our lives as human beings. Human security does one more thing. It personalizes the message on planetary health and makes it relevant to every human being on the planet. And this is one of the things we think is really necessary now. The, the countries of the world, 193 countries, have done a marvelous job of assembling and negotiating the SDGs and 169 targets and of getting commitments from countries to work on them. But I think, as we all know now, the formulation and commitment uh, is uh, is not been sufficient to really ensure the implementation that we need to really meet this agenda on time. And we think one of the things that's been missing is we've not yet been able to get, in spite of all the efforts and communication, we've not yet been able to get the agenda, the message down and personalize it in a way that's meaningful to everybody on earth. And that's where human security comes in. Uh, when we talk about planet, when we talk about uh, climate change, climate change, I, we all understand the magnitude and its significance of this. It's the greatest crisis we've ever failed, ever met. <laughs> I hope we're not failing, but uh, ever faced in humanity. And yet for the average citizen, the, ma the vast majority don't really think it's their business and don't really understand what the implications are for them. But when you convert, when you look at climate change in terms of health, for example, uh, every person on the planet is going to be affected ultimately by the climate change unless we do something radically to stop it. And so this effort to personalize the message and make it relevant to everybody is part of the mission of HS4A. We are eager to explore with you the interface between peace, and we're gonna have a wonderful session on that with some of our colleagues, with sustainable development issues, and with the actual impact that these two very important things have on everybody on earth. I look forward to participating in this and thank all of you who are, uh, are contributing your time to and your thought to help us in this work together. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Let me moderate this panel for now. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Hiro Sakurai of the Soka Gakai International, uh, who will be uh, rap who will be the rapporteur for this session. Uh, again, Q and A button for questions for this panel. Uh, let me then uh, call on Dr. Phoebe Kunduri, Professor Kunduri uh, of the uh, economics, who is the economics, uh, a professor of economics, I should say, and director of the RECIS Laboratory School of Economics at Athens University of Economics. And uh, you can see her uh, uh, distinguished uh, career uh, projected on screen. Uh, I noted that Dr. Kunduri will be sharing screen uh, 
So uh, today I am excited to be here with you and I'm also uh, very happy that I am able to share some of the work that we do on the sustainability transition and connect the uh, implementation of the SDGs, which is what we define uh, the, as the transition to sustainability with human security. In essence, we are in an era of multi-crisis, slow economic uh, growth, inflationary pressures, epidemics and pandemics, climate change, aggravating biodiversity collapse, war, increasing uh, population and inequalities. And we deeply believe, and I hope every single person on this uh, planet is able to acknowledge this uh, via education, formation, and um, experience that the way um, to uh, escape the multi-crisis are the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that in effect provide uh, the um, implementation pathways guidance, our blueprint for the sustainable interaction between natural capital, societal capital, and economic capital in the world. I direct an alliance of excellence for research and innovation on IFORIA that includes a number of research institutions and research teams that I lead uh, uh, across uh, Europe and uh, some uh, technology um, accelerators together with accelerators of social and financial innovation. And also I am part of various um, uh, networks like the Sustainable Development Solutions Network where I chair the Global Climate Hub and the European and Greek Hub of this global network of more than 2,000 institutional members. I am uh, here representing the World Academy of Art and Science and I will try to uh, give you a glimpse of how, of how we try to connect what we do uh, at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network with the Human Security for All uh, project that the World Academy of Art and Science is uh, leading under the auspices of the United Nations. So the UN Agenda 2030 is uh, basically the Millennium Development Goals plan human security aspects. This gives us the SDGs, the 17 SDGs and the 169 targets within them. The first step to understanding how to implement the SDGs is first to understand that they talk about six basic transformations that need to be implemented across the world in each and every country, in each and every region. A transformation in education, health, energy decarbonization, sustainable industries, sustainable food, land, water, and oceans management, sustainable cities and communities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. And it is crucial to understand that this is a very interdisciplinary, integrated, holistic framework and all SDGs contribute to each of the six transformation and no SDG is fully implemented without the other SDGs being implemented. And another thing to uh, uh, know, or at least another thing that I am deeply confident um, about is that if we cannot measure the performance against the SDGs, we cannot manage them and we cannot improve them. And if you look at the figure that I have on the left hand side of my slide, you can see that there was, there is progress um, um, with regards to the implementation of the SDGs. It has been slowed down during the COVID era but we definitely do not have the pace of progress that we need. We are on a, um, on a trajectory as indicated by the blue uh, uh, line, whereas we need a trajectory indicated by the green line. 
Every year, our Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which has a hub in each and every country in the world and has three headquarters, one in New York, one in Europe, the one that I direct, and one in Kuala Lumpur. Every year since 2015, we've been measuring progress against the SDGs. And uh, we have done this for each and every country in the world. And you can see the darker blue color means better progress with regards to implementing the SDGs, where the lighter blue means less progress. And if you go into the report, which is um, uh, electronic, uh, is digital, and it's fully open access, you can uh, find information about each country, the level of performance for each SDG each of the 169 targets within the SDGs and each indicator that we use, we use about 250 KPIs and you can also find access to the models we use to project the trend with regards to 2030 deadline and how uh, will be the performance of each and every country for each and every SDG in 2030, if we keep the same um, uh, the, the scenario as the business as usual scenario. And we do that for Europe as well. We have a, a report for Europe and the Balkans. And we um, in these reports, again, we indicate the level of performance. Red means really bad, diverging from the goal. Uh, orange means facing significant challenges. Yellow means facing challenges. And green means already on track of achieving the targets. And you can see the arrows there, which indicate uh, trends uh, uh, to 2030 in terms of implementation of the targets. And we do that for each and every country. While you're downscaling, it's much easier to use the wealth of data that are available at different um, scales. So uh, for the global report, we use less data because we have to have the data for each and every country. When you downscale, you can use more and more data. And you can see how the whole thing is uh, measured uh, with different KPIs for each SDG. We we may measure and leave no one behind index, which is very important for human security. A spillover index, which shows the effect, positive and negative, of each and every country on other countries. And we um, indicate explicitly how this uh, spillover index and leave no one behind index are calculated. We are even calculating um, uh, the SDG-based measurement of countries' impacts on the global common using value change value chains of products using thorough flow-based accounting. So for example, we can tell you how much of deforestation in Brazil is attributed to the production of agricultural products consumed outside Brazil, and this is embodied in trade. So, uh, and uh, we can even downscale even more than the national level. This is the example of Greece with regards to the different regions within the country. This is very important because we know where we stand, we know where to go, and we can uh, plan, we can develop investment and policy policy strategies and fi financial instruments that can support these investments that are SDG guided. So you have a financial stimulus that can really facilitate the implementation of the SDGs. Now, human security, uh, it's uh, really uh, decomposed into economic security, food security, health security, environmental security personal security, community security, and political security. And what we did in a recent publication, and I should be concluding, I guess, in a few, uh, in two minutes, is that we've collected all the different reports that measure together with our SDG reports under the United Nations Sustainable Development 
uh, network that measure the different aspects of human security. So I also refer to the Human Development Report, the Global Peace Index, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, the Fragile States Index, the Global Risk Report, Ecological Threat Report, Food Security and Nutrition in the World. And what we actually did was try to collect all these different aspects of uh, human security, the, the reports that measure all these different aspects of human security and integrate them into one overall index. And then at the end, so here are the human development index um, uh, and uh, the human development index versus the gross national income per capita. So you can see a positive relationship between the two. The uh, planetary pressures uh, um, across uh, against the gross national income per country, again, a positive relationship. Uh, the human development index for male and females and also other matrices that have to do with economic and food security using the global multidimensional poverty index, the political security using the corruption perception index, the food security using FAO's report on the state of food security and nutrition, the personal security, which uses fragile states index and the global peace index, again, for personal security, environmental performance index, wealth health statistics report for the human and for the health security global risk report for economic environmental and personal security democracy report for political and community security and global terrorist index for personal and community security and uh, i will uh, share my powerpoint all these indexes are um laid out in this powerpoint at the end of the day what okay. we did was uh to and this is my final slide to cross map the sdg performance with the different uh human security indexes and see how much content of the of each of the different 17 sdgs are there to support the other human security indexes. And in this way, we identify how the SDG framework can further support in a very explicit and transparent way each layer of human security. There is a lot of data and analysis in this paper and forthcoming report, and I hope it will be used for policy making and investment decisions across the globe and within nations. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Professor Konduri, for a very comprehensive presentation. Let us now move to our next speaker, Donato Kiniger Pasilli who is the Vice President of the World Academy of Art and Science and the co-chair of the Human Security for All campaign. Donato is joining us from Italy. Donato, you have the screen. Uh, thank you, thank you. I hope you also hear my voice. Uh, do you? Yes. Yes, now then uh, please. Very well. Core messages of human security and the relevance of human security to the SDGs. This is what I've been asked to uh, tackle in my very few minutes. Uh, first of all, Liberato, I want to thank you for the initiative. Uh, it's really timely, uh, your, your event. It offers us uh, the possibility of linking with uh, our genuine partners, the civil society that is core to the campaign of human security. This human security for all campaign, Gary already spoke about that, um, that we are running now almost for one year, uh, that had a, a very long gestation, maybe over two years, and that is also the um, byproduct, I would like to say, of a previous uh, experiment uh, or partnership with the United Nations system on leadership development. 
Um, now we are partnering with the uh, unit, New York unit on human security, that is uh, the uh, legitimate representative at UN of, uh, with, with a UNDP, as it was remarked before, uh, of this particular subject. Although this embraces all uh, the full spectrum of the United Nations activities, and I would say of uh, uh, international uh, international debate and of multilateral relations. Uh, Liberato, you uh, have placed uh, at some point in your presentation the reference to our common agenda by the current uh, Secretary General Gutierrez. And I think this is extremely relevant to start our discussion because um, as this common agenda uh, produced a couple of years ago, uh, has uh, still has a particular purpose. That is to respond to the lack of systemic approaches for to crisis, to crisis situations. And when we talk about human security, we respond to uh, the need of people, to the fear of people uh, in front of growing insecurity. So this is particularly relevant. And some points have been mentioned already by the previous speakers, the representative from UNDP, when, uh, and I want to en enhance and, and to, to remark this point, when she said one of the main areas uh, is uh, uh, renewed solidarity. One of main areas of our concern is renewed solidarity. This is probably uh, the uh, main point of our uh, attempt to really re-engineer a new multilateral system that is not exclusively based on a state-centric approach, but that includes, generally includes, representatives of the civil society. So it is true, as it is said in the um, common agenda, uh, that it is necessary to accelerate uh, the implementation of various multilateral agreements. It is true, as we heard, that we don't have to leave no one behind. We have to protect our planet, but in particular, we have to, to protect the citizens of the planet, uh, I would like to say, and we have also to build trust. This is another very important principle of the, our common agenda. Uh, build trust uh, uh, among the uh, civil society itself and uh, member states. What we have not been able to, to obtain until now, to attain until now. So that would be probably through uh, reforms. Yes, it could be also through reforms. But it has also to go through a, 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 in French you say, prise de conscience, a new sense of uh, uh, um, ownership for what is the uh, general interest, for what is the uh, real um, core interest to people. That is, as we said, as we were saying before, um, and the security, security, uh, and here we have the syllogism between two words, uh, going back to the basics of the foundation of our initiative. The, on one hand, human, uh, and human we intend uh, individuals, as we heard also from Ber Alberto, people, the people-centered approach, not exclusively a state-centric approach, uh, but a, a different perspective where the citizens of the world is the, the epicenter of these international relations. And that has particular interests, particular interests in terms of uh, its own well-being uh, that comprises health, equity, uh, opportunities for a better life. And the second word that is security, that can be expressed in, uh, as, I, as I was saying before, in, uh, in, in tackling this growing fear for a general insecurity that is not just provoked by war, it's provoked by the enemy within uh, that Alberto somehow uh, pointed to. I mean, that, that enemy that has no walls, that is impossible to contain, but that is around us. Uh, because uh, the real the real danger is represented by what we don't know, but we don't we don't know and what we do not understand. 
and that can apply to viruses, uh, to problems, uh, general problems around the world, such as uh, climate change, uh, droughts, uh, poverty, uh, lack of coping mechanisms uh, and, and, and infrastructures everywhere, and also effects of uh, globalization, of technology, of artificial intelligence. So you see, when we we, we have this panoplia of issues uh, that, of course, respond to the seven dimensions that uh, uh, Phoebe before uh, mentioned, and I can uh, mention them again to you, but you see is an expanding uh, kind of uh, um, list. Uh, when we talk about the uh, security uh, issues that we have to deal with, in our daily life as individuals, as humans, uh, we cannot just uh, frame them into uh, you know, some, some wording and, and some uh, definitions. The definitions need to be interpreted. So that, that is the first point I want to make. Um, we, when we started with this campaign, Human Security for All, we used this word, interpretation, as a, a buzzword. And why is that? Because in reality, we need to interpret somehow what is contained in uh, the uh, uh, General Assembly resolution, in the UN official documents about uh, the, 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 the importance of uh, human security, what it is, what, what it stands for, what it stands for, but also the interpretation has to go in the other sense, has to go from the people, how people perceive their fears, how people uh, need, uh, what are people needs and how we can represent them towards uh, national and international authorities. So this is somehow the uh, essential task that we have ahead. And when we talk about uh, core messages uh, and we could uh, recite uh, so many of them, uh, we have to understand that in any case, they uh, will not be exhaustive. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this depends on the subjects, the arguments that we are going to, to discuss, the threats that we are confronted with. And this is why it's so important to maintain a very open approach, especially with the civil society, Liberato, that you do represent. And more and more inputs are required from representatives of uh, the civil society, of international and national uh, civil organizations, because they are really our counterparts. Is our voice in their voice that has to be heard. And in order to hear their voices, we need to understand in detail from, uh, from really, uh, from the example of the people in the street, what is their fear? What, how can you confront that? What is needed? to uh, uh, represent that at an international level. So uh, this for me is the uh, real uh, essence of our efforts that we are, we, have, uh, we are doing as we, as, we, as we continue with our campaign, as we implement the campaign, but certainly the campaign is somehow like a never ended, never ending uh, uh, task because uh, it's something that just just started, but will require years of uh, implementation in the sense of really making sure that people really get hurt and that their concerns are brought around the international uh, international arena. So this for me is the main point, but uh, I, I think that this was already stated uh, even before the foundation of the World Academy of Art and Science, if we think about uh, the uh, shared aspirations of, of humans, that was uh, very well expressed in the 1955 Russell Einstein Manifesto that gave birth to the Pugwash uh, movement and therefore also to was to the World Academy of Art and Science. It contained a fantastic appeal that is still the appeal no, no other appeal in, in my views is appealing as much as that one. Uh, and when, and when uh, uh, this appeal ends with these uh, fantastic words, remember your humanity and forget the rest. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. 
and this is not uh, uh, <laughs> really it, it, the best way not to be verbose about what is the essence of human security is an intimate reflection on who we are and what do we need to do, what do we need to achieve for a better world. And we should also forget about the rest. The question is, what did they mean? Uh, Einstein, Russell, and the other uh, signatories of that manifesto at the time. When I think about that, I feel that they are thinking about all the unnecessary, all the uh, 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 the words that we keep using, the definitions, the labeling that we use for um, for messages that need to be better and more clearly explained to people. Uh, because if that's not the way, it will be very difficult to have a full implementation of the SDGs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are experts in this field, but we forget that we also need to put ourselves in the shoes of the layman, laywoman, and, and say, what do we mean? With those with those uh, targets, really, and we have to keep repeating. They're not they're not uh, easily understood. The great strength of the human security approach is is it is, is that is all encompassing. That in in a few words, in two words actually, it represents the essence of the SDGs. So for that reason, in my opinion, is uh, is in a nutshell describes what the SDGs are and how we can really accelerate their implementation looking within the problems themselves. Uh, so just saying that, I think that we, um, we, we have to uh, consider how we can be better uh, understood and we are doing so in the campaign through so many signatories, so many supporters and partners uh, extremely important organizations that are accompanying us. I will not mention the numbers or, or uh, figures. It's not that the relevant point. The relevant point is that they're growing, that it's, there is a movement behind. We have started a movement through, through uh, thanks to the HS for All campaign that will not end. Uh, I believe that because I think the civil society wants that. We have so many stakeholders. The, the, we have so many uh, representatives of youth movements. Of, uh, we have social media with us that are following us uh, on a daily basis. So this is really our, uh, uh, our strength. Uh, and uh, I mean, so the, 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 the most important thing, maybe I should, uh, I think that the universal collectivity of individuals that is really what is the, the target of the human security initiative can make things change. I mean, they, we can make things change if we consider the universal collectivity of individuals and we can co-create a, a peaceful future for all. But of course, we have also to uh, accompany and, and we have also to interact with the multilateral system as it is, that as it was said before, requires urgent reform, but not wait for the reforms because the reforms will take years to have an effect on the lives of people. We have to act now. So Liberato, I really believe that we have a great opportunity, thanks to you, thanks to the vital people around uh, this platform today, to say what people need and how people can be better represented in the various dimensions of human security that, as we said, are economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, political, but they're not decomposed. They are a synchrony. They have to be considered as an aggregate, as really a, a, an issue that has to be uh, uh, considered univocally with the our common agenda somehow and with uh, 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 with a systemic approach i mean if we forget that we 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 we, we look at the cure but we don't look at the cause of, of of the problem obviously we will never sort out a positive effect so thank you liberato i'm very happy to be with you and to respond to some questions if any thank you Thank you very much, Donato, for a very substantive intervention.
uh, we're now we now have Isabella online uh, uh, with us. So I will call on uh, Dr. Isabella Bun to uh, take over uh, the panel moderation. Thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be joining you from Oxford, England. It's a place that's full of ideas just like this incredible gathering of people that are thinking today about human security and more importantly what do we do next individually and collectively and through all of our networks i loved what was just mentioned about the all-encompassing nature of human security about the urgency of human security and in one sense the infinite measure of human security we will never be finished with this task but we must start now and continue the amazing work that we've already seen happening through the UN security uh, effort, uh, post-Cold War especially, UNDP, the Human Development Report in 1994, I think it was to shift the focus from a military and defense context really to one in investment in humanity and nutrition and health and social and economic inclusion on a grand scale. So it was in 1999 when this trust fund was established to promote human security and to really activate projects. And now again, a new report, UNDP last year, human security threats in the Anthropocene. In other words, the world that is dominated by human life and the ramifications that it holds. So I'm delighted now to introduce our next panelist, who is Ketan Patel with a rich background in business and finance. Thank you very much, Isabella. Uh, thank you, Liberato, for inviting me to this very important gathering. And thank you again on behalf of my colleagues from the World Academy of Art and Science and the Human Security for All campaign for this important collaboration with you. Um, this is a subject that we have studied um, as part of something that I chair called Force for Good. Force for Good looks at the capital in the world and the system of capital and how it moves around the world to identify whether it will actually fund the UN Sustainable Development Goals and deliver the human security that we all think should be here for all of us. I, I step back first and say that since 2015 and the launch of the SDGs, um, the last seven years have shown our ability to do extraordinary things, uh, to address these big issues. Trillions of dollars have been committed by banks and institutions for climate change. The medical development during the pandemic, the high inclusion and huge inclusion programs that have been launched all across the world to include minorities and financial inclusion systems that have been launched that have brought about half a billion people into the banking and payment system. These challenges that we've been facing have brought out the best in us, but also unfortunately brought out the worst in us. And so what we find is all the good things that we might describe really only serve somewhere between a third and half of the world's uh, population. And as that population grows, of course, the system strains to see if it can deliver to, to the remainder. But we should not be mistaken. The current system, the current model of finance and of economics are designed to only serve approximately a third and maybe half of the world. They're not fit to serve the rest. And if we look at it this way and say almost everything we consume, everything we touch and feel is born of fossil fuels and the fossil fuel era and the industrialization that followed that. So the whole system is built on an energy source which gave huge prosperity and created all the interlinkages we see now between the world in terms of trade and the economics that we see that flows through the financial system and puts man on the moon and so on but it is not designed to serve everybody. It has not reached most of the global South. And so it's not a system that can actually survive if we wish to have human security for all. This system though, under strain as it was, has been shaken in the last six to seven years also by populism, by the pandemic and by power rivalry. And so it is unraveling. And the latest UN assessment shows that none of the 17 goals are on track to be achieved by 2030. In fact, 12% of the underlying targets are on track, just 12%. 50% are moderately or severely off track, and nearly 40% have either stalled or regressed below the 2015 levels. That's the scorecard. 
if we simply step back and say, what did we do? We did some fantastic things. And that list of innovations, which we publish every week on the Force for Good website, and to a, a very large group now across the world, is extraordinary in terms of achievements. But the scorecard is very simple. We, we are serving, in terms of the SDG goals, and achieving those, only 12% of, of those goals are being delivered. In the last year, it's estimated that maybe record amounts were invested in the UN SDGs, but progress stalled. And so the funding requirement to 2030 did not decline. The estimate is probably a few trillion dollars have been invested once again, and higher than before. And yet we still step backwards. We do a very detailed analysis and we're about to release next week our report on capital as a force for good, which actually looks at how the money flows through the world, where it ends up and what it's spent on. It also looks at this year, the solutions. And what we find is without innovation, some radical innovation, based on our estimates, the total funding to achieve the SDGs, without this radical mobilization of solutions and initiatives, would take up approximately a third to 40% of the world's money. Clearly that money will not be made available because a third to 40% of the world's money is not waiting to be handed off to something else. It's already utilized paying salaries, building infrastructure, paying pensions, paying insurance, and so on and so on and so on. It, it is not there to be mobilized for anything else. So how do we solve those problems? It seems like an intractable problem despite us being such a smart species with so much depth and such ability to innovate, we seem to fail at this task. Uh, our work, um, which we'll be launching, as I say, sometime next week, looks at how you close that gap. And what we find is there are a number of solution areas. And it's, um, it's uh, exciting to actually find that actually that gap can be closed and potentially in the time scale, but it will require an immense task of mobilization. We identify six solution areas, which I won't go through to take away from the report that I, that I know our people would like to, to put into the marketplace next week. But it points to a series of solutions, six types, which if mobilized and put into the market um, and rolled out across the world would actually close the gap. In fact, what is exciting is they would close more than 100% of the gap so it's not as if we have a lack of solutions, a lack of answers to this problem. We go a step further in the report. We look at it and say, can we be very specific? For example, policy is a big area which can solve the problems. Can we identify which policies should be rolled out? And so we, we look across the world at the policies and who has the best frameworks of policies and how those might be rolled out across the world. And we find that yes, policies can solve nearly a third of the world's problems and they exist somewhere in the world in a form which is very advanced and very sophisticated and can tackle the issues. So there is good reason to be hopeful that actually we can do that. For some reason, the implementation of this is very difficult. So we have gone a step further. We've said, just like the policy one, can we identify other solutions? And we, we will report on 15 such initiatives, which are of different levels of, of um, scale and implementation, but are scalable and transferable globally. And these 15 are, are indicative of what could be done to close nearly 100% of the gap. I, I wish to step back, and I, I, I intended to keep this short and to the point. And I would say that NGOs feature in our list of 15 great things that could be done. And Liberata, you and I have spoken often and touched on how Force for Good should work with Congo, and we very much would like to, because what we find is there are NGOs that are exemplary in terms of their scale, their capacity to fund, their, their ability to make an impact, to measure, to report back. And so NGOs have a critical role to play as part of the solution set that can close this gap. They're usually deeply underfunded. There are a few that are not, but mostly they are. At their best, what we find is they have, number one, a deep knowledge of the challenge. Number two, they understand which solutions work today. And number three, they have judgment on what might work in the future. And they are filled with great people who are very, very dedicated to, to the challenge at, at, at hand. 
And in that sense, they want to solve the issue. And at their best, they epitomize humanity serving humanity. Um, in the Indian language, this is called seva. And this service of others is an important ingredient in the success of the most successful of the NGOs. The IPCC report points to five scenarios that are part of the underpinning of, of all their climate reports. These five are very important. They, they paint a picture of the potential future of humanity and how we might transition. Not after that, but how we might transition. These five scenarios include, number one, a green path where we agree all together to retrench back, to reduce our economic footprint. It seems very unlikely this will happen. Our system is not organized politically or economically for leaders to go to their people and say, I want you to retrench 30% of your economic footprint so that we can save the planet. People just don't seem ready to do it. Even 15 million people dying during the pandemic doesn't make people ready today to actually retrench. Another scenario is playing out the current trend line, which is mediocre and will not achieve the SDGs, will not level up the world. The third is nationalism and security rivalry, which is what we seem suited to. We seem to want to fight each other and find reasons to find fault with each other and follow that through. The fourth is a disunited and unequal progress. We also seem suited to that. Um, those that have it seem to want to keep it, even during the pandemic. Those that were overstocked with vaccines kept them rather than share them very often. And then it took the UN and others to figure out programs for this distribution. The final is a risky gamble to go all out for growth using fossil fuels in the hope that just in time, innovation will bail us out and we will find a timely solution. It's a risky gamble. So there is no ideal scenario. There isn't a conversation around these five to figure out where we should land. And so just as I wrap up, I would say, one thing is clear as we look at the complexity of the systems that allow economics and trade and finance to flow across the world, that individuals have a critical role to play, not because they should solve the problems necessarily, but because they do have a critical role to play because they own two thirds of the world's money. And if we can hope that with rising, rising consciousness comes a more conscious form of capitalism, the individual will probably be the most important player in this system as individuals are leaders, just like all the people on this call. Individual are followers, like many of us on this call. But individuals also take all these positions as CEOs and heads and so on. And individuals, more importantly, are consumers. And as such, something like two thirds of the world's consumption is choice, are choices made by individuals. And those choices will change because the internet is interconnecting all of us. And so we're at a unique point in human history where we get connected to each other in real time completely. It's never happened before. To send messages took so long. It took travel. And then there were phone lines that were unreliable. But now if everyone is connected, it's a unique point where we have a choice and a chance to maybe raise all of human consciousness and awareness so that people are more aware of the consequences of their actions. And we all take different decisions. AI will not only spur that, it will make it an imperative because another potential intelligence is being born that may be more clinically tougher than us, that may be different, that may make different choices. And so we have to raise our consciousness. The conditions under which other stakeholders, not just the individual, but the private sector and the public sector, will make choices about their role and how they can make an impact are explored in our report. And it's positive, as I say, we're pleased to report that, that we are very positive as a result of this very detailed work, that it is in, a, in our grasp to create a more peaceful, prosperous and freer world where human security for all is the cornerstone, the touchstone of how we move forward. Thank you very much for an opportunity to, to say that to all of us. Thank you. Ketan, thank you so much for those words, putting it in the context of the systemic risks, the geopolitical risks, a need for priorities, and I especially appreciated the, the idea of solutions. I remember reading your previous report, and it really was breathtaking. Uh, there's a line, certainly in American English, 
research, follow the money. And I think that's what you've tried to do, follow the money to see how that money can be directed toward the SDGs and toward human security. So uh, I look forward to reading the report and I would recommend it to everyone. You also mentioned uh, a sense of conscientiousness, but I also thought of conscience when I think about Congo. And I've been familiar with their work for many years over a number of campaigns going back decades. And that is what struck me. They are indefatigable, they are creative, they are connectors, and they are so passionate. But in a sense, I remember thinking one night that they're the conscience of the world. Their sense of vision and practicality both, which is an unusual combination. So I wanted to honor them because it is their anniversary. And I think if we think of the cumulative good Congo has done in those decades, it would really be breathtaking and a source of optimism among what must be acknowledged as a fair amount of pessimism as we go about this task. I wanted to raise a question that we see here that was presented um, to Donato about the role of legislators, including mayors and parliamentarians. What is their role at that local level to advance the human security agenda? And in particular, what are the means of collaboration uh, with WAS and with, with other organizations? And perhaps, um, if uh, Donato could answer that question very briefly, we only have a few more moments and then I'll just make a few closing remarks. Thank you. Isabella, could I, could I make a yes. quick answer yes, to that? Yes, please, I was gonna say uh, perhaps- Donato is far more qualified than I am. Donato is far more qualified. My, my, my quick comment would be, our analysis found that about 30% or more, but at least the, around 30%, requires policymakers to, to introduce laws, regulations and governance. And the SDGs were designed for that to happen. It just hasn't happened at the scale that it needs to happen. And without that underpinning, um, capital will not flow. Ideas cannot flow. And NGOs and others that are actors on the ground cannot easily execute the things they need to. So one of the biggest tasks to, to create a very big win for the world is to roll out this policy la layer across the world in, in, a, in a very coordinated manner. And it can be done. You know, and I might just add, as you were speaking, Katana, I was also thinking once the policy is in place, of course, it's a question of the take up, the funding and the implementation. Yeah. And one of the, the positive trends I see is focusing on government outcomes and actually putting the metrics in place to see yeah. that government has delivered on its promises. And this would be another way of amplifying the human security agenda. So I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to close perhaps also on a couple of notes of optimism. Uh, on two themes, which we're starting to see a greater human perspective involved in these questions. One of them is on the notion of peace. And you may be familiar with the work of the Institute for Peace and uh, their tagline actually looked them online, vision for humanity. So they can clearly see that these two questions are very closely linked. But the notions are the following, the, the, what they call the eight pillars of peace, well-functioning government, sound business environment, equitable distribution of resources, acceptance of the rights of others, good relations with neighbors, free flow of information, and high levels of human capital. So within that list, you can see how much can really connect with the idea of human security and put it uh, in that broad framing, which of course also would include SDG 16. The other, uh, because I'm a lawyer myself, looking at human rights questions and also international legal and rule of law questions, there's a real movement now to focus on a human-centered approach to justice. Studies have been done to see what the justice gaps are and they are staggering. I mean, literally billions of people around the world do not have adequate access to justice and to the solutions that it provides. So if we're looking at the agenda, the 2030 agenda based on a just, equitable, tolerant, open and socially inclusive world in which the needs of the most vulnerable are met, we do need to have this human centered approach. And this is being picked up now collectively by various organizations involved in justice questions around the world, the World Justice Project with its data, the American Bar Association, Pathfinders for Justice and so forth. So it's an exciting place to watch how literally the number one principle put people and their legal needs at the center of justice systems, understand what people need and what they want when they seek justice and which obstacles they face and what kind of justice they receive. 
So it means justice is not just magnificent court buildings. Justice is what happens when someone walks into that court building and looks for justice. So I think this notion of peace and justice in a holistic, integrated way would really support the human security agenda. I see that we're at the end of our time. I am so grateful to all of the speakers, all of the participants, the organizers, and the people that are online. And we hope that really what I was thinking ahead of this gathering is make that connection. Maybe if each one of us could think of one thing to do, one organization to contact, one article to write, one set of blogs, one conference to present, I think it would make an enormous difference given the astonishing reach and dedication of the people with us today. Thank you. I'm not giving time to our lead rapporteurs. Uh, I hope that they are ready to come up with a raw report, a report back from what our rapporteurs in the panels and what our lead rapporteurs, uh, Cyril Ritchie, the Congo first vice president based in Geneva, and Janani Ramanathan, secretary general of the World Academy of Art and Science based in India. We, we hear what they privilege as things that they have heard and, and highlight. And uh, gathering the reports from the panelists, uh, from the rapporteurs, we will be producing an outcome document and will be sent to you in due time when when it's uh, ready for sharing. Cyril and Janani, you have the screen. Thank you, Levy. Uh, I'll be starting off. Um, today's uh, Congo 75th anniversary webinar on peace, human security, and sustainability for people on the planet has been yet another enormous success. Uh, the inputs from the speakers were of a very high level, and the uh, amount of material that we have gathered and with inputs also from the rapporteurs from the different panels will all appear in due course in the final report. All we can do today, firstly myself and then Janani, will be to give you a few highlights, uh, particularly in my view some very important quotes that we have to take away. There are takeaways in every speech that we've heard today. Indeed, particularly, as was said right at the very beginning, that we do not linger in empty words. And that's why so many speakers have emphasized the role of people and of people's organizations in moving beyond empty words that we too often hear from governments. Let me, uh, as on behalf of Congo, particularly say how glad and proud we have been to have uh, WAAS as a co-sponsor and it has been excellent to work with them in the framework of the program of human security for all. Many people emphasized the interlinkages between these, between these different concepts, that peace is an essential condition for human security and human security is an essential condition for peace. Indeed, that without both peace and human security, there can be no sustainability. We were reminded of how many conflicts there are in the world. There are perhaps more conflicts now than any recent period. Some of them are longer and deadlier. Ukraine is an example, Yemen is another, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo is yet another. And as we were told, including by an ambassador, the UN has never been weaker. And yet we absolutely need the UN and we need a UN that conforms to what its charter specifies. Remember, the charter was not invented by some bureaucrats. The charter was written by governments. And it is up to governments to implement the charter, whether or not they are members of the Security Council and of the permanent membership. And for the purpose of this seminar, of this webinar, looking forward to the SDG summit and the summit of the future 2024 is in this, we are we are a part of the preparations for that and a part of the input uh, which will be uh, contained in the indeed in the reports of all the webinars of which is this is the fourth and there are two more to come uh, many people underlined that the summit of the future is itself uh, the best chance we have for a new vision that will put the UN back on track but there's need for more, more competence, 
more solidarity, more inclusion, and more vertical solidarity towards future generations. I'm particularly glad, I think, to hear about the work of the UN Peacebuilding Commission and the steps being uh, made uh, to strengthen it as an essential uh, part of the UN structure. Uh, we were reminded by many that all the crises we currently know, COVID, war, climate, water, are all impediments to achieving the SDGs, but that the very fact of their existence requires that we achieve the SDGs. And the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda is something we must all support, work for, and persuade governments to act on, without which we will not achieve the SDGs. Uh, two or three other points before I hand over uh, to uh, uh, Janani. The, uh, I loved one or two of the very pertinent quotations. If you can't measure sustainability, you can't manage it, and you can't improve it. A second quote, going back a long time, remember your humanity and forget the rest. Many people have criticized the current status state of the multilateral system, which is, as one man said, unraveling, and therefore progress towards the SDGs has stalled. It is the policies that are out there that we need to mobilize. And uh, as one speaker said, existing policies uh, could solve one third of the world's problems if we could identify them uh, well and in good time. And several speakers in various ways underlined how NGOs as people's institutions have a critical role to close the, the gap that exists with the SDGs and the gaps that are appearing in the multilateral in multilateralism. Because NGOs, which are representing people's grassroots knowledge, understand what works and what might work if only it were given the chance to uh, to uh, to be implemented. Two other points. Several references were made to the absolute importance of international law, of applying international law, of implementing international law, and of giving international law the place that it merits in the center of the future of the future world. I think I have to close my highlights now. I want to say that there is a um, a wonderful remark by one speaker in referring to Congo and this its 75th anniversary year, that Congo is a connector. That's a very good term indeed. And um, in the chat box, uh, there was a request for Congo to continue these dialogues. I think in closing, I can say, yes, that indeed is Congo's well-known role. And we certainly intend to carry this forward together with our a relationship with, pressure on, and setting an example to the governments in the UN system. The UN system is what we need, and we therefore need governments to implement the commitments that they have made. And now I yield to Janani. Thank you, sir. Some of the points that we heard today were, one is, NGOs have, have come a long way from being observers in the background to becoming a major force today. We now have a shared vision and a greater consciousness that together we can do more, transcending all kinds of borders. The need for human security is highlighted, highlighted by the fact that six out of seven people feel insecure today. Insecurity is in many areas at many levels. Our insecurities must be tackled together comprehensively. We need to empower people. A human security starts with uh, people and what it means for us to be safe and secure in our, our homes, our jobs, our communities, our environment. There are serious challenges that we face. The list is very long. However, Every crisis is an opportunity and radical solutions can be relatively 
easily implemented or accepted due to the pressure of the very situation. Speakers underlined the link between peace and the development. We need to divert our funding from preparing for war to preparing for peace. And the SDGs, they represent a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity. There are gaps between where we are and where we need to be. The SDG scorecard shows us that just 12% of the SDGs are on track. A lot of our development serves half or, or less than half of the global population. But there are also some shining examples that we need to build upon on our pathway to 2030. And uh, problems come when uh, from what we don't know and what we don't understand. But there are a number of solutions. Science is on our side. The SDG gaps can be closed. In fact, we do have the means to close more than 100% of the SDG gaps. And, and what we need for that is, is knowledge sharing and policies. And these policies need to be rolled out across the world. And, and NGOs have a critical role to play in closing this gap. And as, as uh, a speaker said, we are at a West failure moment. And to rise to the occasion, we need radical organizational and cultural changes. And, and there was one comment which said, we need creativity and courage to create the change. Organizational change includes strengthening of multilateral organizations, better global regulations, better management of global commons, and involving more young people in decision making. And uh, cultural change is about greater inclusion, tolerance, human rights, a greater commitment to ethics, and a positive attitude towards our planet and future generations. Uh, we, we also need increased uh, trust between ourselves, between nations, between uh, generations. And the very essence of human security is an intimate reflection of who we are. And I'm repeating the Einstein-Russell quote, which Cyril shared with us, because I, I think it's so important. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. Absolutely outstanding was one of the comments in the chat window in response to today's discussion. And I agree with that. And as uh, one of our panelists today said, the best is ahead of us. However, our future depends on the choices that we make today. Thank you, and uh, over to you, Lidra. Thank you very much, Cyril and Janani, for the raw report back, uh, substantive as they already are. Uh, now we are coming to a close. Uh, I think we will do well. We were set back by 20 minutes earlier. I don't think we will be uh, uh, we will be closing uh, longer than necessary. Uh, it's my usual uh, thank you to all, but there will be a discussion on the capture of the multilateral system and the so-called multi-stakeholderism and what is at stake at the summit of the future. This is being uh, organized by many groups, including the member of Congo, FIAN, the Global South, the Transnational Institute, the Friends of the Earth, and so much more. Again, concerned about that shrinking space. And then on September 13, the, human, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights here in New York will be convening a discussion on the civil space and how to enhance participation through strengthened partnerships. Uh, that's also part of their celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We share a, a 75th with the UDHR. So without much further ado, let me call on my co-organizer lead, uh, Dr. Gary Jacobs. Well, Liberato, thank you so much for calling on me, but I think so much has been said and there's been so much to observe. Uh, I would only like to say thank you to you, to all the sponsors who have helped organize this, to a fantastic group of speakers uh, and to our active audience that has fed us with, with important questions. And I'm as eagerly looking forward to the uh, report of the rapporteurs 
who have the challenge of taking all the meat that we've heard, all the substance that we've heard. I'd only like to say that this has been a really energizing experience, focusing on the issues, directly on issues that need to be addressed and focusing to a very large extent on solutions that can be implemented. And I think we're all left with, I'm left with the voice of the youth uh, because what we really need, we need a strengthening of the civil society organizations. We need the work of Congo and organizations like this that can create a voice from below uh, to really generate the support and the pressure for change at the national and the global level. And I think we have to do better in mobilizing the next generation uh, and their voice and getting them further engaged. And I'm saying that on behalf of the Academy and World University, World University Consortium and our human security campaign uh, met wonderful people today with inspiring ideas. And on behalf of our campaign, I would like to say we welcome the opportunity to work further with you, uh, with Congo, and with all the organizations that have been present here in our shared commitment uh, to really making things happen now. And that voice of determination, the energy and the determination in spite of the difficulties and even the confidence that we can do this, I think that's the greatest asset that, uh, that, that comes out of this meeting. So let's do it together.